So it probably goes without saying by now, most of you in this room know that I absolutely love music. Music is something that's in my heart and my soul, much like golf or football or basketball or painting or farming or fixing or crafting or scrapbooking or cooking is for many of you all. I'm not really that artsy or crafty and I really can't cook well, but music is something that really resonates with me. I love to play the piano or the guitar or the bass because they can express things in me that I can't pull out of myself any other way. Now, I don't play any of them very well, but I like to play them. Music has become a way of, um, music has a way of becoming like words when I can't figure out how to form them. And so this week I've been thinking about the lyrics to a song that was written in the 1960s by a man named Curtis Mayfield. It's a really fun song to play with a group of people and it describes life, but it also describes the Christian life. The song is called People Get Ready and the lyrics go like this, don't worry, I won't sing them. People get ready, there's a train a-coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. Don't need no ticket. You just thank the Lord. Then the person who's singing goes into uh, this repetitive line. They sing, I believe, I do believe. I believe, I do believe. And it's catchy, isn't it? It's a catchy song. There's a train a-coming. There's a train a-coming to take us somewhere. And after this week where we had a pretty substantial funeral here in this space, I'm grateful for the image of a train coming to take us home, especially to our resurrection home. But there are no shortages of other trains that are coming to take us to places like Chicago or Portland or New Orleans or Washington, D.C. You don't need no baggage for this trip. You don't need anything, nothing to weigh you down or hold you back. You just got to hop on. It sounds so tempting to me. I don't know about you all. But then comes the line, all you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. Now the train's not here yet, but it's coming. How do we know it's coming? We can't see it. The whistle is still a little far off in the distance, but it's on its way. The stop bar isn't down across the tracks, but we're assured that the train is coming. You just need faith. You just have to trust or believe that it's around the corner. Tickets aren't necessary for this ride. No friends, all you have to do is thank the Lord. Faith is the name of the game today. And faith is one of those elusive things for us as Christians because we can't wrap our heads around it. And if we can't wrap our heads around it, we sure can't wrap our eyes around it. And so it becomes hard to say or to describe or to pinpoint what faith is. But faith is the ticket if we want to continue Curtis Mayfield's image for the Christian life. Faith is essential for our life as Lutherans in the Church of Christ because we say that it's by grace that is God's love freely given through faith that we are saved or that we are made right with God or that we are able to live life as a new creation. So what then is faith? If someone were to walk up to you and to ask you to define faith, what would you say? Most of the time I talk about my own faith as a bold, radical, daring trust in the mercy and the love of God, but even that doesn't always get at what faith is. I think for many people who live in the western part of the world, we tend to think too much about faith in terms of our cognitive abilities and what we can know. We tend to overthink it here in our head. It tends to live up here and to become one of our inventions or our rationales. But what if faith isn't like that? We tend to say that we confess our faith and profess our faith in the words of the creeds here in the church. You know, the Apostles' Creed that we're going to say in just a minute, or the longer Nicene Creed that we say, or that weird creed called the Athanasian Creed that we might only say once a year. Those are statements of belief, and we tend to think of faith in terms of those things that I can spew out of my mouth and tell you that I believe those principles that we know and think are true. But could faith be more? 
Can we let faith be more than that? The author of Hebrews starts out our second reading today with a substantial claim about faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. There's this dynamic character to this notion of faith. The author of Hebrews claims that faith is the assurance, first of all, of things hoped for. So that means there is some actual substance and basis and grounding for what we hope for. And there are lots of things that we hope for, especially in the life of faith. We hope for a good future for us and for the world. We hope that there will one day be peace on earth. We hope that maybe we could get to a point on focusing on what unifies us rather than what divides us, like those who were marching for unity yesterday here around South Haven. We hope that death is not the end of us or of our world and that God's claim of resurrection that we see in Jesus is true because death is so final, so ending, so dark. Well, if faith is the assurance of things hoped for and all of these things then would be true, you can't really assure someone of something that isn't at least a little bit true. And so this grounding and this assurance that we have from faith hurls us forward into the future and gives us the courage to move forward even when we can't see or don't know where we're going. This faith of which the author of Hebrews talks about is not something that one of us can manufacture or make. It's a pure gift from God. Verses 2 and 3 of chapter 11 say, By faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. So see, here's the important thing. Faith doesn't ultimately depend on us. It's a gift from God that we receive at creation through Jesus Christ, the word of God made flesh. In Jesus, we see the power of resurrection, that God is making all things new, including each of us, each and every day. That's the power of forgiveness. That's the power of daily dying to our sinfulness and all that stuff that keeps us from God. But as we watch the daily dying and rising in Christ, especially in other people, we see the invisible power of God revealed as we become the witnesses and the people who share what God is doing in our lives in the world. And witnesses are exactly what we get in the rest of our reading from Hebrews. We get the witness of Abraham and Sarah, two of the most influential people in church history. Abraham and Sarah show us what it's like to hold fast to God with the assurance of things that are hoped for. You see, they hope for children. They want so badly to have children, and God knows this and makes a promise with them that they will have children. But how can they hope for that? They're both old, and they probably have one foot in the grave, and the other foot is still walking around hoping and wishing. God's promise seems utterly ridiculous to them, and they've probably just about given up. God makes promises that their descendants, though, will be as many as the stars of heaven. That promise is enough to urge them forward and to keep moving to this new land that God is going to show them. But this also seemed ridiculous because they were a couple of wanderers living in tents, not sure that this was ever the place that they're supposed to be, or never sure of when they're going to have to move again. Their destination is unknown, but their faith and the obedience to God's promises help them to press on. And so our reading says that Abraham and Sarah, along with other people that we will meet in Hebrews next week, never received the promises. Faithfulness, it seems, lies in the fact that they were courageous enough to be led into the unknown, not knowing where they go, but knowing that God goes with them into a future that is God's. And there are countless other people like Abraham and Sarah that teach us about the life of faith that propelled them into the future too. We name those people in our prayers each and every week when we talk about the saints. 
They are the people who have been important to the church, but also to us too. Family members, friends, fellow congregation members, and other people too. You see, faith is this whole picture of these two dimensions. This holding fast part and this moving forward part. Some of us are really good at holding fast. We know the stories of the Bible. We know the stories of the people who are gathered around us in this place. And as we tell those stories, they become our stories and they give us grounding. But we have a hard time moving forward. We have a hard time with tents and we bring along way too much baggage for the train. But others of us love to camp and to travel light. We like to be on the move. We like to venture out into the unknown of where God is. But we have trouble holding fast. We need others to help us to learn the story and hold fast to God's promise when the road becomes long and rough. We need both aspects of living in the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. See, together as the people of God, we can help one another with faith. Together you can help me and with you can help me with a part of my life and my faith life that is lacking, and I can help the part of you that is less comfortable too. Faith is complex. It sets us on a journey where a lot of times we have no idea where we're going. The GPS signals don't work. There's no map that has a destination on it. The old camera hasn't even taken a picture of it yet. But we live with the assurance that the train is coming. So listen to the hum of the diesels and invite somebody else to listen with you. Travel light. You don't need no baggage. You don't need no tickets. All you got to do is thank the Lord. Amen.